Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for a tribal gaming webinar that offers us some useful data extraction tips to help you make your casino's financial audit easier and more efficient. My name is Carla. I'm with the REDW marketing team. Before we get started with the actual presentation, I'd just like to cover a few <coughs> housekeeping notes. If you have any questions during the session, please type them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. To stay on schedule, we'll probably wait till the end to answer all your questions at once. Below the Q&A box, you'll find brief profiles of each of our speakers along with their contact information. And if you click on the green button at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a list of resource materials with links to relevant documents and websites you may find helpful. About this time tomorrow, you should receive a follow-up email that provides a link to an on-demand recording of this presentation. At the end of the session, a quick evaluation form will pop up on your screen. We hope you'll take a moment to provide your feedback on today's webinar so we can be sure to improve on the next one. This hour-long session qualifies for one continuing education credit. To earn this credit, you must prove your participation by answering all three polling questions that have been inserted throughout the session. Your CPE certificate will then be issued via email in about two weeks. We have three presenters for today's session, two from REDW's Software Solutions Group, Mustafa Kamal and Christine Readers, and Tony Gerlach from our Audit and Assurance team. All three have considerable experience working with tribal casinos from both the accounting software side and from the perspective of the external auditor. So first up, we have Mustafa Kamal to get us started. Take it away, Kamal. Thank you, Carla. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today. It's a lovely day, unless you are in Oklahoma or Texas. Be safe if you are there. Um, we'll start with a polling question. Um, Please be sure answer this question if you um, need CPA credit. What accounting software do you use? Page Intact, Page 100, Excel Spreadsheet, others. You'll have 30 seconds to answer this question. Okay, we'll give you a few more seconds to answer the question. And remember, if you want CD credit, please uh, be sure to answer this question. All right, go ahead. When you are extracting data, we're going <clears> to <throat> talk about, you know, what is the purpose of data extraction. It could be internal and external. So for internal use, you may need to reconcile gaming activity to general ledger. And gaming activity reports could be many operational reports. Tony Garlick will talk about it later on. It could be department income statement, not only income statement, it could be uh, supporting documents to the income statement, depending on your uh, different departments, division, location, or cost centers. They may require different kinds of reports. It could be your tribal council or board um, requesting uh, different kind of reports, mainly financial statements. Within those financial statements, it could be income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement, budget versus actual report, or any other operational reports. Come on, in that regard, maybe you could uh, you could talk a little bit about certain systems that have a statistical only section. For example, I know some of the the main metrics that casino. Uh, boards and councils look for sometimes are things like uh, coin in or uh, attendance, you know, bingo attendance, those sorts of things. So are, are those capabilities present in most systems? 
Yes, you know, uh, those are your um, gaming operational system that um, that will allow you to give those reports. This is Christine. Additionally, um, a lot of the uh, systems that you use will allow at the general ledger for you to have what they designate as a statistical account, which will allow you to post entries in there that don't don't have to balance like most of your journal entries to keep track of that kind of information for you so you can generate reports for those um, key point indicators that are important to your operations. Great. Thank you, Tony thank and Christine. Yeah, yeah, thank you, guys. And, you know, just to, to further elaborate, those are sometimes some of the key metrics that the auditors are going to be looking for, too, when they're doing their, their uh, data analysis, looking at revenue between years. They're going to be looking at you know, certain drivers of that information, whether that be, again, coin in, attendance, et cetera. So it's uh, useful information for the auditors as well. Thank you. External. Auditors will ask you to uh, provide them different kind of uh, data, for example, trial balance, general ledger details, and financial statements. Um, you know, trial balance could be just a simple GL level trial balance, or you, you may need to add all the different dimensions, for example, location, department, division, cost centers, things like that. A general ledger detail will generally include, um, you know, all the details you can, uh, you can get from the system. Different auditors have different um, parameters of this data or, uh, you know, columns they want in, in those reports. Financial statements, you know, Tony will add, um, his insight about what is going on uh, uh, with the financial statement with uh, with the audit group. Yeah, thanks, Kamal. Um, you know, so speaking from somebody who's who's mainly wearing the auditor hat, um, as you mentioned, Kamal. Typically, when we get the audit started, and this isn't going to change, we're we're going to be looking mainly for the trial balance and general ledger, so we can start looking at what the material accounts are, start looking at the general ledger detail to uh, do things like pulling samples, uh, doing data analytics, those sorts of things. Um, and, and typically we wait till the end to look at the financial statements. But I did want to elaborate a little bit on that um, for some rather recent developments. So uh, as historically has been the case for, for us with most of our clients, the preparation of the financial statements and footnotes has typically been an auditor responsibility. Um, there have been some recent changes to the AICPA independence framework where, uh, especially if your audit is performed in accordance with government auditing standards, also known as the Yellow Book, there is more of a burden on the auditors to show that they are independent in cases where they are preparing the financial statements. So um, it still obviously remains to be seen how this is exactly going to play out, but it's possible that that duty of preparing the statements and footnotes might shift more to the auditee's responsibility. So just something to be aware of, um, that that task might be more of an internal um, responsibility than as, than as compared to the auditors. And of course, with that comes some challenges, of course, uh, they're typically most facilities prepare their own sets of financial statements in some fashion to again present to the report, present to the boards, present to councils, etc. But in a lot of cases, there's various types of things that are classified or, or grouped differently in the internal statements as compared to how it needs to be shown for the audited statements. So, for example, things like complementaries or those types of things might be shown as a departmental expense, whereas for the audit report, they're shown as contra revenue. So, just some things to consider going forward. That you know, when you possibly might be asked to prepare these going forward, that there are some modifications that would need to be made to make sure that the statements are in accordance with GAAP as compared to how the internal parties prefer, uh, prefer to have the information presented. Thank you, Tony, um, for your insight. The next set of report uh, may be your financing um, authorities uh, like banks 
wanted some uh, audited uh, reconciled report, uh, financial statements mainly, and they may require those uh, periodically, for example, yearly or by, uh, you know, semi-yearly uh, or uh, quarterly. Also, you know, compliance report for uh, mainly for state agencies, state gaming agency may wa um, want different kind of report. One example is gaming net win report. And, and Tony might add a, a few things in that regard, Tony. Yeah, for a number of the states that we work with, uh, Arizona being one, uh, the, the casinos and tribes need to pay a certain percentage of their class three net win to the state. So like you mentioned, Kamal, there's gonna be various reports out of the system, typically that the, uh, the state gaming agencies are gonna be looking for you know, to basically verify the the validity of the amounts paid to the state. So uh, it's important to have those reports ready and prepared and, and reconciled to the general ledger. You know, to you know, just to to make sure that everything is is uh, uh, reconciled together and, and um, you know to verify the uh, the information provided and the payments made to the state. Great, thank you, Tony. Now we're going to discuss what. Uh, data need to be extracted in what format? So when you are extracting data, depending on uh, you know internal or external need, um, you may want to extract data like vendor, customer account detail, general ledger detail, and financial statements. Now, when you are looking into vendor customer account details, generally those are internal uh, reporting needs um, for uh, for uh, different purposes. Um, depending on you know what they need, your data fields varies uh, will be va will be varied. Now, general ledger detail report, uh, you know auditors once it um, you may. Uh, your different departments may require those reports too. Depending on, again, their requirements, um, you need different data field in there. For example, you know, what transaction source is coming from? Is it from accounts payable, receivable, or cash disbursement? You know, what document number is there, document description, who is the payer, um, things like that. Also, some software allows us to um, include fields like who entered data from which computer, who posted, who edited, things like that. Those are important for audit purposes, in, uh, especially for forensic audit, and also reconciliation purposes, and also to find out you know, where the mistakes are made and who made those mistakes so that you can talk to them and correct those mistakes. Financial statements, as Tony mentioned, that there are different kinds of financial statements. For example, you know, uh, grouping of your GL, uh, your internal uh, need may want a grouping of GL in a different format than uh, than your external um, needs. So, depending on you know what kind of grouping you need and what kind of detail or summary you need. You may also look into a different type of column that you need, for example, budget versus actual, remaining budgets, you know, what percent of budget used, things like that. Format. When you are exporting data, you know, what format do you want to export the data for? Mainly depending on your external and internal need again. So there are many ways <clears throat> you can export data. The most common ones is Excel and CSV. Uh, CSV and Excel are similar file anyways. Uh, plain text, t .txt format, sometimes you need that too. Adobe PDF, many a time you want to export data in Adobe PDF when you are sending it to external um, entities. Um, because, uh, you know, Adobe, is, 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 their data is not easily changed or manipulated. Now we're going to discuss a common operational report, and I'll hand it over to Tony for this section. Thanks, Kamal. So, uh, again, 
talking from you know an audit perspective mainly when we're thinking of a casino the most um, critical if you will and the most um, important likely area of the financial statements is is the gaming revenue so as the auditors that's where we're going to spend a lot of our time looking at slots table games analyses reports those sorts of things so just to cover a few of those uh, theoretical the actual is going to be one looking at the performance of the machines um, what the actual hold is compared to the theoretical percentages set by the gaming manufacturers looking to see if those variances are being investigated on a monthly basis, which is one of the requirements of the mix. Uh, metered actual, another important one. Some of our, our review is gonna be on more of a controls basis, where we're gonna be looking at daily reports to, to see if those metered actual uh, variances have been looked at and reconciled. And then another report that we've spent some time talking about is net win report, looking at the uh, the machine net win, again, on a daily basis to see if that's been reconciled to the drop reports, the payouts, the Tito tickets. Uh, not only are we going to be looking at the daily information from more of a controls basis, but then we'll typically look at it from a yearly basis too to see whether the balances have been reconciled to the general ledger, to see if the Revenue Audit Department and the Finance Department are essentially coordinating together on the accuracy of those, of those reports. I just want to take a minute and talk a little bit about the kiosk just because uh, this would be the one area which is uh, probably the most trouble from our standpoint as the auditors with, with reconciling the activity. And mostly of that has to do with, with the cutoff of the reports in uh, as compared to the cutoff of the gaming day. So, it, you know, to the extent possible, you know, you want the reports matching up to the gaming day cutoff, whether that's 2, 3, 4 a.m., whatever it might be, um, to cut down on the extent of those timing differences. So it, it, that kind of reminds me of, of some conversations I've had in the past, and maybe not so much recently, but thinking back 5, 10 plus years ago, um, I always remember giving the casinos a call leading up to the end of their fiscal year end date to remind them that somebody, you know, typically from the audit or finance department needed to be on site at that year end cutoff date, again, whether it be 2, 3, 4 a.m., to run various reports that needed to be run in real time that could not be uh, gone back to and run historically. I think now as we've transitioned to more modern systems, if you will, that that capability, capability does exist in most instances. But you know, if, if your property is using uh, maybe a, a system that's not quite as current as some of the others, there's still possibly that requirement that you're going to need to run those reports in real time as of that year-end cutoff date. So something to be aware of that the auditors are going to be looking into to, to see if everything's been appropriately reconciled. Great. Thank you, Tony. Time for um, question number two. Uh, please make sure if you want CP credit to answer this question. For what purposes do you primarily extract data? Audits, management evaluations, forecasting, finance slash compliance? You have 30 seconds to answer this question. Great, I see the results. You know, mostly data extraction is audit purposes, 80%, management evaluation, 20%, um, forecasting and finance compliance, 0% at this time. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, for our rest of the discussion, we will talk about a little bit about both um, in our discussion.
Thank you so much for answering those questions. Um, now we're going to talk about how do you extract data? Again, uh, it, it entirely depends on the system, what system capabilities are, you know, how they allow us to extract data. Many systems actually allow you to extract data th through report writer. And report writer, m many of the systems that we deal with has built-in report writer so that you can go into a different kind of report, for example, um, trial balance. You go into trial balance report, you tell the system what parameters, or what date range you need, what kind of segments or uh, dimensions you want uh, to include, for example, department, location, division, cost center, and general ledger account number. And then, um, you know, the different columns you can also use, for example. You can look into just debits and credits, or you can have comparative trial balance where you can see what happened last uh, year or so, you know, what are the differences. Now, if you do not have report write, built-in report writer or it is not easy to, uh, you know, uh, change uh, set reports from the system, you may want to talk to your business service provider who can uh, who can help you in this regard in case you know they cannot help uh, there are other opportunities for example you know many systems allows you to access data tables um, um, back end data tables um, if your database is sql um, or uh, you know um, access or, uh, you know, uh, depending on what kind of, uh, or Oracle, depending on what kind of um, uh, data structure you have, you can you can go back and if you know uh, enough SQL, you can go to a SQL database, run queries. And SQL queries, if you know enough, uh, it's very easy to build and then, and then run those. It's like a report writer. Now, if you do not have capabilities to connect back end, uh, you may want to talk to um, uh, any programmer or developer who can, uh, or your business service provider who can um, help you to do that. You know, they can uh, connect um, the back end through ODBC connection, you know, direct SQL connection, or some other ways. If your software is, um, uh, software uh, it, it has API, then it's, it is easier to connect back end. Now, if you have, you know, if your system lacking any of those capabilities like direct report writer or, you know, directly go into back end, you may require third party product to extract data from your system. As you mostly mentioned that audit purposes, you need those uh, data and also, you know, departmental reports. Depending on, you know, what auditors want, you can ask, uh, you can use uh, many third-party products. Um, with our experience, we have um, looked, in, uh, you know, we dealt with, you know, SQL, um, Reporting, uh, JET reports, Crystal reports, Tableau, those are a few examples that we come across. And, uh, you know, with those third party, it works like a report writer within your system. You know, of course it is outside, you have to open that report up, and then you can actually create and control um, report parameters in there. Now, those are a little harder to use than your gen, uh, normally uh, built-in report writer. And there is a training component in it too, so whoever providing those uh, third-party software can um, teach you, you know, how to use those, or they can build those reports for you, and you can maintain them as necessary. Now we're going to talk about common problems, uh, you know, while you are extracting data. As well, you know, if, if the data, if data integrity is solid, if data is correct or not. So first one is incorrect report parameters. 
Many a time, you need to print two different reports. For example, if you are looking into um, an income statement and supporting details for the income statements, those should uh, you know, match both reports. And when you are comparing Apple to Apple, those should match. For example, if you are looking into detail in a different date range and your income statement for a different date range, it will not match. So date is an important parameter in there. Many a time you are looking into your AP deed accounts payable detail to your general ledger account and reconciling those. Again, you need to look into similar parameters or data range you are looking into. Many a time you are looking into different kind of uh, data, uh, you know, data sets. For example, when you are looking into data from different software, you need to make sure you are looking into those uh, different software in, in same time period, real time, or snapshot uh, in, in time. For example, a snapshot report like balance sheet or trial balance is, is a snapshot report. And a real time report, you, you want to make sure that everything is posted uh, you have all the data in. If you have third-party software, if you have different software that you connect, make sure those are connect real time. Or you are, if you are importing those data from other systems, make sure you are importing those before you extract data from your main system. Because you know those data is part of the overall data from your GL system. Data integrity. Many software allows you to look into if your data is is in good shape. For example, you can test your data integrity. Um, one example could be your GL detail and GL summary match. Your accounts payable detail match to your GL. Uh, things like that. You can look into system and then they provide tools to look into and say, hey, your data is intact. And one obvious reason you know your data is not balanced if you uh, look into your standard balance sheet from the system and it's not balancing, then, then you may have an issue. Maybe um, an issue of the way you, you set up the report, but you know, your data may be corrupt. Other areas, uh, you may have insufficient data um, if you change software recently. Software implementation is complex, and you are um, converting from one system to another. What happens, there is timing issues. Uh, you may be running uh, two different software parallel for a while before you go live. Um, when you go live, some software uh, allows you to go live without the beginning balance or GL detail or you know, vendor and customer details in the system. So make sure you know you have those in place before you extract data and give it to your auditory departments. One major thing that we encounter many a time because we are software implementer, people change software when their needs are changed, when they grow to a different level. For example, let's say you had a small, tiny casinos. Now you have several different casinos. You have different div division and departments. You want report by those location, department, divisions, and so on and so forth. So you are changing uh, or adding new dimensions with your So if you look into your um, legacy or old chart of accounts, you may have uh, just unidimensional chart of accounts. Now you have many different dimensions. So make sure when you have, uh, you have a need of a changing chart of accounts and um, you have a mapping from old chart of accounts to new chart of accounts. And when you send GL detail and trial balance to auditors, make sure you send the mapping to your audit team too because you know, then they have the idea you know, what happened in the, in the um, um, implementation process. Timing difference between document date and posting date. Many software have allow you to use many different dates. For example, your uh, invoice date and your check date will be different. Some many a times, and then 
you know, your posting date of an invoice could be different than your uh, actual effective date. The reason, let's say, you closed a year, a uh, few months later, a, a vendor who uh, found out that they didn't send you an invoice for a long time, and they may send you an invoice. You may not want that invoice to go to your uh, old fiscal year that is uh, audited and already closed. So there will be a timing difference between invoice date and document date. So Kamal and Christine, question for, for you guys. You know, looking at the at the theme of this slide, so, you know, common problems. Um, you know, when, when I think of that from, again, wearing my auditor hat, you know, typically we're, we're looking at subsidiary schedules as compared to the, to the GL balance. So whether that be the AR or the AP aging, or maybe it's a system out of the uh, report out of the fixed asset system, you know, the first thing that we're going to be doing is comparing the subsidiary ledger total to back to the general ledger control accounts. Um, and I was just curious, you know, what you guys see as the, the main reasons that those are going to differ, which which happens quite frequently. You know, at that point as the auditors, we just we kick it back to the to the auditee to resolve. But, you know, my understanding is that, that some systems might prohibit you from making journal entries to, you know, to some account balances. You know, for example, like when we find a cutoff issue with AP, um, in recommend an adjusting entry, most of the client time the clients will come back to us and say, rather than crediting the AP control, can I credit some other account like a manual AP or some other accrued liability because the system won't allow me to credit AP directly through a journal entry or maybe it's just that they understand that that's going to throw off their reconciliations. But in those instances where the system doesn't allow you to make journal entries directly to those accounts, then I guess my question would be what what does cause the the reconciliation differences then in those instances? So usually uh, what will happen is over, let's say, in your accounts payable module, you have your invoice date, which is the document date, and then you also have your transaction date, which is the true posting date. If you've already closed your periods, you can't go back and post to a period that has been closed. So what users will do is they will post it into the um, most op the recent open period. And so when you're running your accounts payable aged invoice report, that report is looking strictly at your invoice date regardless of when it was posted into the system. And when, then when you're looking at your trial balance over in the GL, that's looking at the posting date. So, you know, now you have some discrepancies there. You can, in some systems, they will have, let's say, an accounts payable trial balance. Those trial balances typically look at the posting dates in, regardless of the invoice date. So when I'm working with people that come to me, and, you know, because the auditors have kicked it back saying, hey, we have an out of balance, please justify. First thing I do is I look at the aged invoice report, compare it to that trial balance for that module, and let the users go through the detail and find out which invoices have a date that goes into their audit that should or should not be there so that we can do that justification. Um, yes, and there are some systems that will not, even if the period is open, but you don't necessarily want to do a journal entry for the accrual, so you get, you know, after January, you've closed out your December year-end, and then you get this significant invoice for a purchase that, you know, is pretty material, and you want to be able to recognize that, you know, in your accounts payable, it has to hit January because you've already closed December and or issued your financial statement. So what we'll do is we'll set up a contra account directly as the very next account under your accounts payable or accounts receivable, whatever the case may be, so that 
it doesn't really change the reconciliation between the true AP and the subsidiary module, and then that contra account can be cleared out in the following month whenever that invoice was truly reconciled or recognized. Thank you, Christine. One other thing, um, you know, I, I see, Tony, that um, when we convert from one, uh, one system to another, uh, there, there, uh, you know, many clients have significant AP or AR balances. And then what we do, um, like Christine mentioned, that we create a contract account uh, because many systems don't allow you to um, do a journal entry to a to a P or AR through AP and AR ledger sub ledger. So what we do, we, when we bring in beginning balances, we put that balances in, in a contract account. And then when they are paying their vendors for those open invoices, they pay against that contract account uh, against cash. So that way it clears out over time. Uh, that's good insight. Thank you. Yeah, you know, like, like I said, in, in the, the instances where we do have differences that the system will allow it, you know, typically the first thing we'll do is, uh, just at a high level, just look at the, the GL detail to see if uh, some sort of a manual journal entry was was hit to that account that might create the difference. But, you know, I'm just curious what you guys see in, in instances where it's not possible to make those entries. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Now we... This will discuss about how do you modify um, or format data for end user. Again, uh, it depends on the system you are using, but uh, my point here is when you are extracting data, um, the data should be exactly what the end user needs. If not, then uh, you know, look for other avenue or how you can do that so that you don't have to manipulate or format data. Um, you know, uh, manipulate of data, I, I'm not a big fan of that, but you may need to because you don't have any other option. Uh, so when you are, uh, you know, you have the data set, now you want to format it for the end user, that's all right, formatting is all right, but when you are starting, you know, uh, modify, delete, and, you know, start using those um, uh, tools to, uh, you know, change the data structure, you may actually corrupt the data. So that's my point, uh, you should have extracted data the way your internal or external users need. Uh, be careful uh, to modify data. Formatting is all right. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to hand it over to Christine, who's going to talk about, you know, in a very uh, broad way to talk about, you know, how to extract data without going into detail. Thank you, Kamal. Uh, yes, yeah, so we're going to take a brief look at some of the more extra uh, common extraction methods, and we're going to be using Sage Intact, which is one of the SAS systems that we support. Um, and just for your information, because of wanting to speed the presentation, we are not doing a live demo, so they are screenshots but we could definitely talk to you and give you more information. If you want. Um, so here in Sage Intact, we have created a dashboard for a controller, which contains a lot of the operational information, financial uh, information reports that are important to them uh, as, on a regular basis. When the user logs in, they can come directly to this dashboard and see all their information right at their fingertips with real-time data, um, and including some of those key point indicators. So going back to Tony's question, these numbers going across the 92,000 know, uh, are some key point indicators based on some calculations. The, on our, this report, it has a sales by square foot, which uses a statistical account uh, 
for the square footage of a warehouse to come up with that information. So here's just you know a nice sample of what you can do with some of those statistical accounts. Uh, when you have your reports displayed on a dashboard like this, there's a couple of ways that you can export. The first one, if we look at the cash flow by entity, uh, there's a little pencil in the upper right corner that we would click on to put us into the edit mode of that report. And based on the user's permissions in the system, if they can access this, they would then get into the edit mode of the actual report where they can then run the report. And so what we would do is we would click on our preview and that would give us a few options depending on the system that you're looking at. In our case, we have where we can run it as a live report. It will preview it here on our screen. We can print it to a PDF, which would be very important if we're wanting to email this to some external person. Um, and or if we want to kick it out into Excel so that we can do some additional calculations. So if we click on our Excel option, then the next thing that we will see is our Excel will open up and the report in its entirety would be kicked out into Excel where it's fully formatted where we could then do any additional calculations we needed or send this to somebody if need be. The other option we have is what they call drill downs. So when you're looking at dashboards or if you've run some reports that might be in summary on your system, any number that you see or any item that you see that is in blue typically indicates that it is that you are able to drill down to get to more information. So on our income statement by entity, we have our sales summarized down to one single line where we may have various different types of sales based on you know, your revenue sources. And so if we're cu curious to see what makes up this $181,000, we would simply click on that number and it would bring us into a drilled view of the general ledger information and give us all of the detailed behind or the detail behind that $81,000. Once you're here, you have some additional options for exporting this data where you can kick it out to Excel, a CSV or a text file depending on what type of data extraction you need to do. So we'll just click on it as an Excel export. And then it takes all that information, opens up your Excel, and puts it in there so that you can do some additional analytics, uh, send it off to your auditors so they can import it into their audit systems, and you don't have to do a whole lot with it. Um, so that's very important. And then the next step that we're going to do is we're going to explore creating a simple report. And we're going to do this at a high level. So in your systems, if they do allow for you to create your own lookup reports like what we just saw, the first thing you want to do is to determine where that the information is in your system. So if you are looking for, say, your vendor invoice information, you're probably going to want to look at the detail level so that you can get the GL accounts that it was posted to, maybe some information about the items that you've purchased if you do track with inventory and run it through a purchase order system. Um, you know, in Typically, if you link, if you're selecting a detail table, it's going to bring what they call header information, which is where the vendor name, the address, shipping information, terms, 
uh, freight, different in, uh, summary type uh, information associated with your document would be kept at the header level. Um, and then, so it'll automatically attach those files together. So once we've determined what, where the information is and we've selected our table, we would then go in and decide what fields we actually want to see on this report. So for our example, we've selected from our detail, we want to see what the amount is from the lines. We want to look at what department those individual expenses were coded to, maybe a memo. Uh, we also want to see what our vendor name and ID is because we need to know who we purchased the information from. After we've selected that criteria, then we would determine the sequence that we wanted. So we might want to see by department and then by the ID, name, date, amount, and memo. Uh, you can reorder these any way you want to see them. And then if you want to, any additional information, maybe you would like a summary based on the amounts, or if you want to do a record count, you know, how many invoices are on this report, how many vendors are on this report, um, you can select to count on those fields. And then if you have any filters, so in this example, we're going to look at our base amounts being greater than $1,000. One thing to note when you are designing this in your report or your data extraction that the term greater than is not the same as greater or equal to. So if I wanted to see everything for $1,000 and up, I would select greater than or equal to so that it will also select the $1,000. And it's the same in reverse. So if you're looking at less than is not the same as less than or equal to. So um, if you pulled your data and you're looking at it and you're thinking, hey, I'm missing some information, look at some of this filter. Then you would see your results. And if it is what you're looking for and you're happy with it, you can choose to add it to your dashboard so that it's available anytime you want it. And, or you can also export it to Excel. So here we have an example of what our report would look like once we kick it out. And that's the end of our very brief demo on creating reports. Thank you, Christine. Um, Last question of the day coming up. Make sure you answer this question if you require CPE credit. What difficulties do you experience when extracting data? Select all that apply. Unable to determine where the information resides. Linking tables correctly. Missing data slash replicate data. Getting data formatted correctly. You have 30 seconds to answer. So Kamal and Christine, while we have a, a few seconds here while the, uh, the question's being answered, question for you. So uh, Christine, thank you for the demo. Um, just curious to get your thoughts or, or insights on something. So you know, within the last five years, I'd say, um, I know we at REDW, as, as are a lot of firms, have um, explored the option of doing more of our work remotely to where we keep our travel time and costs down um, to you know, save on the audit costs for for our clients, and I know in a lot of cases, then the the conversation will shift to whether we as the auditors can log in and access the client's system remotely. Obviously, with with read only capabilities, you know, is that sort of capability more commonplace, more easy to do now over the last several years? I would imagine that as an, as an industry that that's 
had some high level of, of priority recently, but I, I wasn't sure. Um, thank you, Tony, for asking that question. Um, I'll, I'll go first. If, you, if Christine has some um, additions, she will add those. Um, depending on the software uh, you, you use, for example, what uh, Christine showed is the Intech software. It is fully cloud-based. Now, if the software is cloud-based, anyone can access it from anywhere. That gives option for auditor, you know, when they are given permission by the client, uh, of course, read-only and data accession, you can access it from anywhere. And then Intact has, you know, requisition module in there. They, uh, you know, if, if uh, they're using a timesheet with third party, then you can you you can uh, examine those timesheets, you know, online. You you can look into almost everything into detail online if if, if it is a cloud-based software. Now, if it is not on-premise software, sometimes client can give you access through VPN or some other connection. Once you have that connection, and of course the software needs to have the capabilities to give you permission to go into look into things. So uh, these are the different ways. So what our experience these days, day and age, people are leaning more into cloud-based software. It is easier for everyone. For example, if if a client, uh, you know, CFO or CEO, you know, or controller traveling and they have some uh, something they got to approve, it's a big dollar amount and priorities and things like that. They can do it from their um, iPhone or you know PDA or anywhere they can access internet. So this kind of capabilities, you know, help everyone, not only auditor but everyone involved. Christine, you have anything to add? It, the the one because I see a lot of that actually, and um, the one thing that I would say is if if they do have an on premise solution, and they are granting you the auditor's remote access because there's a lot of problems with crypto viruses actually using the remote desktop logins. Uh, one, they should set you up, designate one person within your firm to be the person that logs in to their system and create a VPN connection so that it is more secure. Um, if they're just going to let you allow remote desktop app to log on to their network, uh, definitely under protocol, do not save your login to that remote so that the crypto viruses can't take that login information from your computer, log on to their systems, and infect their networks. Um, I have seen that quite a bit. Um, a lot of times, depending on the software, they have licensing, you know, they're named licenses. So you, you need to work with your publisher or your reseller to get a license that would be a read-only or a report viewer type only user so that you're not, the client is not paying full user permissions for somebody who's one, going to be using it for a month or two during an audit and or the only thing they're going to be doing is re running reports. Excellent. Thank you, Christine. Um, thank you, Tony, for asking that uh, important question. Um, we're going to discuss the results uh, of the last question. Everyone said formatting data correctly <laughs> is, 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 is the most important part. You know, again, depending on, you know, what software you use and, you know, how you are extracting data, but the second or, you know, two of them are the same here unable to determine where the information results, half of you say that was imp uh, you know, the issue. Uh, linking tables correctly, that was another issue, so I assume that you use many other um, uh, software or you know, within the software you know, looking into different reports and linking them. Missing replicated uh, data, uh, you know, 25% of you um, uh, choose that. So, you know, we can definitely uh, look into your issues. We are from software department, um, myself and Christine. So we have uh, on your screen 
in a minute you'll have our information and if you need any help let us know there is a question uh, in there and then i think tony can ask, uh, answer that question is there training available for class 2 gaming a new casino with uh, new fine finance people so tony do you want do you like to answer that Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, that's one of the things that we're, we're uh, doing this year, as a matter of fact, is, is putting together a, a catalog, if you will, of all the different courses that we offer, whether that be finance and accounting related, um, mix related. You know, we'll go over each of the, uh, the areas that we do, mixed compliance, test work over, gaming machines, table games, cage, et cetera, um, focusing on the, the areas that have the most findings, um, you know, an overview of IGRA, state compacts, yes. So we're in the process of uh, preparing that catalog. And if there's anything specifically that, that uh, the attendees would like training on, you know, feel free to contact any of us and let us know. Um, and then finally, I'll just mention that in November, we're preparing for a one-day gaming conference um, in Vegas. Uh, each year, REDW on our tribal side, we conduct a two-day tribal finance and leadership conference that we hold. Um, this year, we're going to add a third day specifically focused on, on gaming and related topics. So be on the lookout for information about that upcoming in the, the next few months. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, um, everyone, for joining us today on this call. Um, so if you have any further questions, go ahead and, and type them into, your, uh, into the Q&A box and we can answer those via email or you have our speaker's contact information there and you can contact them later. And remember, at, uh, when the call ends, a quick evaluation form is going to pop up and we'd appreciate getting your feedback. Remember also to watch for a follow-up email tomorrow. It will contain a link to recording of this session. And your CPE certificate, if you express an interest in earning credit, that will arrive by email in about two weeks' time. So again, we appreciate your participation and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. I don't see any other question at this point. Um, um, you know, we finished a minute or two early. Thank you again. Um, um, see you next time. Bye.